talking about troubleshooting from the perspective of the Ruckus WAN gateway, we want to talk about being alerted to when a problem has been detected uh, within the system, as well as knowing where to look in the system for other information that can lead you to uh, issues that you may have or allow you to decipher log messages to figure out maybe why a connection isn't working the way you think it should. Uh, right now we're on what is my uh, dashboard. So the first thing that I'm looking at is my uplink. This is my WAN uplink. So we can see the uh, uplink in and outbound traffic statistics over the last 24 hours. I will say that on most of these dashboards, you can come over to the side panel here and click on the little carrot and you can go down to the dashboard time range and you can click on the gear icon and we can change this so we could actually choose uh, the last seven days and then we can update that and see that now our chart has changed. Um, it doesn't always change what you're seeing down here. Um, it did change this one to the last seven days, but you could additionally change this particular top data consumers uh, window by clicking the little gear there and kind of pushing that out. If you wanted it to go 30 days, leaving everything else at seven, you totally could do that. And it'll spin and then it'll say, okay, we're the past 30 days. I don't have 30 days with the data, so it didn't change, um, but you can configure each of the things here um, to kind of represent the time frames that you want and make sure that you're seeing the uh, date ranges that you need. In terms of notifications, as you can see here, uh, when there is a threshold that is met, a critical threshold, a warning threshold, whatever you define, uh, it can change the color of that particular area and then it will throw up a message in the top banner that you will see no matter where you are throughout the system. So you can see I'm switching around here and I still see this critical core temperature uh, message that has been exceeded. So um, you can configure these thresholds through services notifications. And you can see if we scroll down, there are some not notification thresholds that are, that are automatically defined um, within the system and you can create additional notifications as well. Um, you can also configure notification actions. Uh, there aren't any by default. And the notification actions, if you create a notification action, you can kind of specify what kind of event you're looking for um, all the way down to uh, if you're using IoT location-based services, when a crowd is formed, that can be an event type. So when a, when a crowd is formed, it can perform a message, do a web, web hook, or execute a backend script. Uh, and you can define you know, all that stuff down here further within the uh, custom messages scaffold, campaigns, web hook, uh, backend script, scaffolds. So you can do a lot of cool stuff in terms of having the RWG kind of keep an eye out for you and alert you uh, when some condition is met. If I click the top level of these options, uh, a lot of them produce a graph that we can take a look at that summarizes kind of the overall health. So if I click on system here, we can see CPU utilization over the past 12 hours, memory utilization. Uh, we can see top system processes, uh, disk utilization, we can see uh, backups that were taken and, and download them directly from here. We also see this is where you can reboot, factory reset, or shut down the RWG device. If I click on services, we can see similar graphs you know, that relate to the services that we're running. So DHCP leases over the last 12 hours. What do the pools look like? How many addresses have been uh, leased out from these pools? How many are remaining? Uh, what devices are getting what lease from what pool? We can see that information here. Uh, I'm not running a Radius server, but we could see Radius requests uh, frequency here if we were. Um, we can also see if we scroll down service information. So obviously we can see which services are running and which services are not running. And then we can see what the hardware resource utilization is for those services that are running. Uh, and if I click on any of these icons, I can actually get back into that particular service. So I just clicked on DHCP and we're taken into the DHCP configuration. So a lot of um, ways to navigate around in this menu uh, to get the information that we need. Um, if I click on instruments or if I go to instruments in the top right, we can see a lot of the same information, but um, we're gonna drill down into some specifics. If I click on Mac DHCP DNS, 
we're actually shown our Mac table, our Mac entries. Um, and I can tell, you know, what VLAN they're coming in on, what type of device they are, if that's identified there. Um, I can flush individual Mac entries, or I can flush all of the Mac entries. I have the option to do either of those. Uh, I can also see the DHCP leases regardless of the pool, but we can see which pool it actually came in on, what VLAN it's associated with, what the, again, what the device is. Um, and from here, I can actually convert DHCP leases um, into static addresses. So if I go down to, let's say, this laptop here, this is a laptop. If I click on uh, create new under fixed host, I'm taken to the create DHCP fixed host scaffold. So I have the name defined already. I have the IP address. I could choose to override that with a different IP and then I could flush that one. But if I want this one to just always be 107, I'm gonna go ahead and click create and it's gonna do a static entry right from here. So if I go back up to services DHCP, we can see that laptop fixed host information right there. If I go under connection states um, from instruments, we can see a lot of source port, destination port, application type information. Uh, we can look at interface assignments. We can look at NAT assignments for the network address translation. Under network monitor, we can see, uh, if we actually were managing a smart zone instance, we could see some wireless AP channel statistics here. Uh, if we were doing some ICX management, which we will be uh, in an upcoming video, we'll see that here. We can also set up some ping targets that can kind of do health checks for us, let's say on our uplinks. So if we had tied these ping targets as a health check to one of our uplinks and the ping target um, actually wasn't reachable, uh, we could set the status of our uplink to disabled and choose to fail over to another uplink if we had one configured. So a lot of stuff you can do there. Uh, you can configure speed tests and speed test results. So uh, likewise, if the connection is up, it's just slower, uh, but you want to swing traffic to another uh, uplink that, that doesn't have the problem with speed or, or has better available speed, uh, you could do that as well. Um, we can also go under instruments and look at like our route entries. So I'm not running IPsec or I don't have OpenVPN or BGP configured, but I do have some just basic routes based on the networks that I do have defined. So we can see that information here. Uh, we can look at traffic rates overall. So let's go under traffic rates and we can see a lot of different um, tables that break down, you know, some priority flow queues, interface rates, uh, things like that. And then going all the way back up, we can look at utilities. So under instruments, utilities, you can see that it does include some basic things to do pings. So we could ping, uh, you know, uh, we could ping Google DNS to make sure that that is working. We could do a trace route. Uh, we can do a, re a resolution of DNS uh, there as well. In the top right field, we have this search box here as well. This is really powerful. I can paste in a MAC address, an IP address, a machine name, and click search. And it's gonna take a look at all of the, throughout the entire RWG device um, for details on this particular uh, MAC address. So right from this screen, I'm shown uh, which policies that this particular um, device applies to. So right now I've only got the default policy that's doing that block subnet. And you can take a look at the earlier video that, that outlines that, um, but we've got that is our only policy. If we had multiple policies, we could see which one was active, uh, shown in red. Uh, and then of course you can see that from a list view as well. We can see the daily traffic for this specific device over the last 24 hours, um, broken down by utilization, um, bytes per hour. We can see um, the destinations. If we had some account information that was configured on this, we could see that here. Again, this is the one that we actually configured for the uh, fixed IP address. So we can see that it does have a static DHCP mapping and um, we can see you know, session information, NAT assignments. A lot of information can be found through that search. So that is also a good place if you're having issues with a specific device to kind of take a look at. The last thing that we're gonna talk about with regards to troubleshooting is under the archives tab. So this is where all of our logs live. So we've got logs for notifications, like we would have saw with that temperature warning, that would be here. Uh, we can see administrative logs. So from a administration configuration perspective, kind of what's been going on on the system. Um, we can see connection logs, DHCP, DNS, 
uh, pretty much any service that you can that you can configure here you can look for a log on and if you go to the dot log files tab you can actually get an overview of all of the different um, log files that are running within the RWG device. So if I go to DHCP server, which I am running a DHCP server, I can actually see those DHCP requests coming in from this dot log view. And I could choose to filter this even further or download it. And this is kind of running anything. So anything that I'm running on this device, I can actually get directly to the logs for and see what's going on from the perspective of RWG. All right, let's move on to configuration backups. If we go under system backup, we can see the first thing in the top left is the option to go ahead and do a manual backup. We can go ahead and download one directly from here and we can choose what information to include in that backup. Uh, by default, it is gonna just do the configuration, but we could choose to include the billing data, the portal information, graph databases. Um, we can choose some of them or all of them. And we can go ahead and do the download backup and it will download a zip file directly to um, this machine. So whatever the download directory is for your browser, it will go ahead and throw it in there and we can see uh, I got this zip archive here that I could then turn around and restore from this screen as well. So um, if I wanted to, I could, if I made some changes that I didn't want, I could grab that and download, uh, upload that and restore that backup. I also have a backup listed here um, for my daily backup, which is a default um, daily backup. I will say that this has been edited. By default, it only includes two copies of daily backups, so two days of backups, but I have changed this to five days of backups. If you edit this, you can actually configure it to how you want as well. So you could change the frequency, you can change what it includes, and how many copies uh, of that of that backup that you want to keep on hand. You can also define a backup server and push those backups out to that. I would totally recommend that. Um, but I have this configured this way and I've got these backups that have run uh, that I can download. So if I want to go to four hours ago, I can download this. I can restore that backup. Or if I want to go to um, yesterday, I can, I can do that as well. Um, so again, you can define those backup servers and uh, push those backups and uh, get those backed up off-site. Updates to the RWG are performed through system update. And as you can see here, we are shown the current build and the current OS release, as well as provided a link to the release notes. We have an option here to download a backup, which is recommended before you perform any system upgrades. And then we've got two options to actually do the upgrade itself. We can perform an automatic upgrade, or we can download the package from the Ruckus support site and manually upload that file and update that way. That's gonna wrap up this particular demo. We hope you join us for additional videos in the future.